Yep. All right. Welcome to Lorraine. And it's all, all your right. Time. Thank you so much. I am so excited. You have no idea. All right. So many of you have heard me refer to my interest in English ceramics, especially Wedgwood ceramics. I have been collecting, studying, and lecturing for approximately 35 years. The output of Wedgwood's production since the company was established in 1759 has been prolific as well as diverse. One would be hard pressed to assemble a collection in which every type of ware and every example was represented. While I have attempted to collect across the spectrum, I have to admit, I do have some areas of concentration. In the 18th century, under the leadership of Josiah Wedgwood, the company was innovative and trendsetting. To quote him, beautiful forms and compositions are not made by chance, nor can they ever in any material be made at small expense. A composition for cheapness and not excellence of workmanship is the most frequent and certain cause of the rapid decay and entire destruction of arts and manufacturers. I have to wonder if William Morris was acquainted with Josiah Wedgwood's sentiments. Josiah perfected body types, which other companies had been producing such as creamware, red wares, and black basalt. In this photo, I share a circa 1790 creamware plate, which is decorated with depictions of seaweed and shells in green enamel, a redware club-shaped jug with decoration, which Wedgwood called dragon Kenlock ware, circa the 1890s, and two examples of black basalt busts. The first, circa 1890, is of Cicero, and the other is Sir Walter Raleigh, circa 1810. However, more importantly, he invented new body types, such as his famous Jasper. Jasper is a white stoneware, which is stained using metal oxides to produce different colors. Jasper can be molded, turned, polished, or ornamented. It can be gilded or enameled. This plaque, which is a recent acquisition, is an example of black Jasper, which is sprigged with white Jasper figures. It depicts the frieze on Wedgwood's most iconic vase, the Portland vase. This example of a Portland vase is in my collection. The vase itself is from approximately 1850, 1860, and it stands on an antique stand. You'll notice that this stand has a mirror in the base, and that is there because the base of the vase is flat, and it has a depiction of a head wearing a Frisian cap. But getting back to the plaque, this plaque was modeled by Bert Bentley, 1878 to 1937, who was the modeler and ornamenter at Wedgwood. His specialty was to use 18th century molds and techniques to recreate portrait medallions, the Portland vase, and plaques. Josiah Wedgwood was the first to create a brand to perfect marketing and to create the next trend and supply his customers with products which they didn't even know they wanted until he created them. In the 19th century, like all companies, Wedgwood created products which the Victorian customer craved. Competition for customers was stiff and the Wedgwood company wanted its share of the market. As tastes changed, new products were designed, styles evolved, 
different artists were hired and Wedgwood, like every other English ceramic manufacturer had to keep up with the times in order to prosper. The arts and crafts movement was initiated as a reaction to the prevailing decorative arts and the conditions in which they were produced. The reformers sought to change the standards of manufacture of the decorative arts in mid-century England and the way that they were currently being produced using machinery and factory production. It was thought that products produced in this way were badly made, were excessively ornate, were artificial, and that the manufacturer was ignorant of the materials used. Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin anticipated the movement when he advocated truth to material structure and function. John Ruskin's arts and crafts philosophy was derived in large measure from his social criticism, which related to the moral and social health of a nation, to the qualities of its architecture and to the nature of its work. William Morris was the towering figure and main influence of the arts and crafts movement. His aesthetic and social vision of the movement grew out of his ideas, which he developed in the 1850s with the Birmingham set, students at Oxford University, including Edward Byrne Jones. Of course, I chose this version of the well-known Morris quote, have nothing in your home that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful, since it depicts ceramic pots. Today, I'm going to share with you one specific area of my Wedgwood collecting. This niche of Wedgwood's production is squarely rooted in the English Victorian taste. The pieces which I will illustrate show Wedgwood's production using the Marsden process and are mostly from my collection. Additionally, I will share some examples which are in the collection of friends and museums. Wedgwood's pieces of Marsden ware illustrate one line of manufacture, which was produced to accommodate the arts and crafts style. While we know that a tenant of the arts and crafts movement was that beautiful and useful household items should not be produced by machines, the question that manufacturers had to grapple with, excuse me, grapple with was the economics of hand production. How could they remain financially solvent? How many units could be produced and how could they maintain a consistent product? Ceramic manufacturers had historically produced handmade items, a pot, was either thrown on the wheel by a skilled artist, or when molded, a less skilled person needed to assemble the mold parts, pour the liquid clay in, remove the piece from the mold, clean the mold lines, and hand it to a decorator. The labor to create a pot was expensive. With the growth of the middle class, who had expendable money to spend, Wedgwood wanted to produce a new line of wares, which had the look of a fully handmade product in the latest Victorian taste, quickly and in great numbers, and importantly, in a cost-effective way. This is the story of Wedgwood's Marsden ware. George Anthony Marsden, 1838 to 1907, was born in Wales and lived for some time in Liverpool. He was a ceramic decorator and an inventor as it related to the production of ceramic products. 
While there isn't much biographical information about Marsden, I was able to use census and trade directory sources to help fill in his story. According to the England, Wales, and Scotland census of 1881, which we see here, it tells us that Marsden was born in 1838. His father, Thomas Gilman Marsden, born in 1811, was a clay cloth manufacturer. His mother, Jane, was born in 1815. George was married to Helen, and they had a daughter named Maud Mary, who was born in 1878. Marsden's technique for tiles, which we are most interested in, produced textured patterns in low relief with a hand decorated appearance. He called it, and I quote, improvement in the manufacture of colored or ornamental tiles, bricks, and other like articles. Previous to Marsden's innovative technique, which I will explain, a well-known decorating method, which was employed by potters, was called tube lining. A rubber bulb was filled with clay to which a nozzle was attached. This device was used to outline a pattern on a pot. The pattern was then filled in with tinted clays or glazes. This process is similar, similar to cake decorating. And you can see a picture down on the bottom left. As you can imagine, it took a highly skilled artist a considerable amount of time at great cost to complete a single pot. This is an announcement of Marsden's pattern. It stated, George Anthony Marsden of Liverpool in the county of Lancaster for an invention titled Improvements in and relating to tile coverings for walls and other structures, dated the 4th of October, 1877. A simple explanation of his process is that a die was impressed into the surface of an unfired tile, leaving areas of high and low relief. Glazes would then be applied, giving the impression of tube lining. However, a more accurate description is, by placing on the bottom of the mold or pressing onto the yet unfired body of a tile, a pattern, design, or arrangement of colored dusts or pigments, artistically drawn, painted, or arranged on an inflammable or removable background of paper or other suitable substance, filling up with the main of dust or clay and pressing in the usual manner. These are examples of some Marsden tiles. Robin Riley and his two volume Dictionary of Wedgwood offers one more explanation of this incredible process. Riley states, by placing on the bottom of the mold designs in the embossed cardboard, paper, woven fabric, or other inflammable material that will not be apparent on firing and covered with adhesive matter upon which wet colored dust has been sprinkled or to which the colored dust or pigment required, if any, has been caused to adhere, then filling up and pressing. And here are a few more examples of Marsden's tiles. This process achieved a handmade look at greatest speed and lower cost. The process created stunningly beautiful pieces. In 1880, Wedgwood bought this patent. As I mentioned, it was titled 
improvement in the manufacture of colored or ornamental tiles, bricks, and other like articles. The next year in 1881, Wedgwood began production of tiles using this process. Many designs were available. The agreement was canceled in 1888 after a severe drop in the tile business and Marsden was briefly employed at Wedgwood's Etruria factory to decorate art pottery with molded and raised slip patterns. Etruria is an area in central Italy. The Greeks knew it as Tyrenia. In 1769, Wedgwood opened his new factory and called it Etruria. Originally, it was for the production of ornamental wares only, as it was for the side of this business with his partner, Thomas Bentley. The large estate featured housing for his employees and a sick club, a scheme to help infirm workers. These were subsidized by Josiah Wedgwood. This factory remained in use until 1950, when the current one opened in Barlaston. But getting back to George Marsden's time at Wedgwood, he was responsible for another specific type of wear which appealed to the Victorian consumer's taste. Wedgwood called it Golconda wear. Marsden was responsible for the introduction of Golconda decoration the elaborate raised gold and bronze paste decoration on bone china, which was introduced in about 1889. These are two examples of Wedgwood Golconda wear in my collection. It is interesting to note that the consideration of manufacturing tiles goes back to the 18th century during the time of Josiah Wedgwood I. Thomas Bentley, 1730 to 1780, was a highly educated, sophisticated, and well-traveled man. He and Wedgwood met in Liverpool in 1762. He was a general merchant with a thriving import-export business. For 11 years, Bentley served as Wedgwood's London manager and his very close friend and confidant. He had a great influence on the company's production. In August of 1767, Wedgwood asked Bentley to look out for a sober tile maker in Liverpool. And in September of 1769, Josiah once again set out to Liverpool to inquire about a tile maker. Josiah saw a business opportunity in the growing trend among the gentry to build dairies, baths, and temples. Josiah was attracted to the tile business as a single dairy would consume up to hundreds of tiles. To illustrate this point, I show you these Queensware tiles in the historic dairy at Althorpe, home of the Spencers which are decorated in Wedgwood's Napoleon Ivy pattern. The Liverpool ceramic printer, John Sadler, encouraged Josiah, stating his belief that the cream color of his queensware would make a great vehicle for printed tiles. Being occupied with his main business, Josiah did not fully pursue tiles at this time. However, we do know that by late 1776, tiles were in production at Wedgwood. Josiah wrote to Bentley, suggesting that tiles would be a good addition to the Greek Street London showroom. Small quantities of tiles were produced by Wedgwood over the years, but it was not until the 1880s when the Marsden patent was acquired that tiles became an area of concentration for Wedgwood. By October of 1882, Clement Wedgwood, 
great grandson of Josiah the first, who was a partner in the business noted, and I quote, the tile business not going right. We don't get the contracts. The tile business at Wedgwood continued to decline until the tile business was closed and the building and pattern books were offered for sale in 1902. Before we talk about Wedgwood using Marsden's process, let's complete George's story. In 1889, after Marsden departed from Wedgwood, he established the Marsden Tile Company. It was in Dale Street, Bursalem. On the 1st of October, 1896, the wares produced by the company were described in the Pottery Gazette as that they, quote, included printed floral and geometrical patterns and a patented rainbow glaze effect. They had a London showroom and a growing export trade with the colonies and South Africa. They were still calling the US the colonies. In July of 1897, a new patent titled Improved Dyes for Use in the, in the Manufacture of Slabs or Tiles was filed. It went into effect the following July. George Marsden Potter, at, together with engineer John Newton, went into partnership to manufacture tiles using an improved method to make tiles which would better adhere to surfaces. This diagram for a patent which the Marsden Tile Company was granted it shows fin-like shapes on the back of the die, which were pressed into the wet clay of the tile. When cement was filled into the impressions on the back of the tile, it was better able to adhere to the surface of a building or to a wall. This is a trade sign for Marsden's establishment in about 1900 along with samples of his glazes. And as an aside, I have to tell you that these two pieces came up in an auction as one lot. Um, it was an auction just recently, this past summer in England, and I tried my darndest, but I got outbid. Shucks. This is Kelly's 1904 trade directory. We know that Marsden's tile business continued. According to the 1904 Kelly's Trade Directory, the name of his company was Marsden's Tile Limited. In 1904, Marsden was living in this house at 223 Waterloo Road, Bursalem. George Anthony Marsden died in March of 1907 while residing in Stone. The tile business continued after George's death. In 1912, Kelly's reported that while in the Dale Street location, encaustic tiles were added to their production. On the 29th of October, 1929, the London Gazette reported that Marsden's Tile Limited would be liquidated on the 30th of November, 1929. This is the end of Marsden's story. Turning our attention to the Wedgwood production using the Marsden process, patterns were obtained from independent designers and production was begun at the end of 1881. Louis Foreman Day, born in Peckham Rye on the 29th of January, 1845, and died in London on the 18th of April in 1910. He was an architect by training and a designer of interior decoration. Day was one of the first promoters of the Arts and Crafts Society and was a founder of the Art Workers Guild. 
He was additionally associated with the Royal Society of Art. As he was involved in these groups, he was closely aligned with William Morris and Walter Crane. Early in his career, his design work was in glass painting and stained glass. He went on to design furniture and ceramics, wallpaper, carpets, book covers, and textiles. Day wrote many books on the alphabet, the decorative arts and architecture, and even about William Morris. Louis Foreman Day was on the committee in a consultative capacity at the Victoria and Albert Museum when in 1909, it was established in the new building on the Cromwell Road. He was chosen to arrange the collections. In 1870, Day formed his own design firm, working with manufacturers to which his company provided designs for glass, wallpaper, carpets, and ceramics. And in 1888, under his guidance, the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society mounted a show highlighting the productions, excuse me, the products produced by artists from around England. He was hired by Wedgwood in 1883 to be the principal designer using the Marsden process. His Art Nouveau inspired designs reflect nature with seeds, leaves, and flower heads. So this was the beginning of bringing together Marsden, the process, Wedgwood, the company, and this designer. These two examples, which are in the British Museum, are Wedgwood tiles done using the Marsden process and were designed by day. Okay, my, okay, my, there we go. I was having a slide problem. This ceramic clock circa 1880, 1880 and the upholstery fabric circa 1901 were both designed by Day. This lovely pair of terracotta vases were designed in 1878 by Day. They represent sunlight and moonlight and are in the ceramic collection of the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. Until now, we've been discussing tiles, flat surfaces, which employed the Marsden process. Yet, we will see how it was also used on rounded or hollow wares, such as vases. Now think about this. If a vase is of a cylindrical shape, a strip could be placed around the circumference and the pattern could be neatly applied. But if the shape of the vase was bulbous, for example, a symmetric application would not be applied evenly. Therefore, the die would need to be adapted to perform perfectly. Another way to visualize this is to think about a Mercator map. This is a way to see the geography of the world when it is depicted flat and not on a spherical globe. The design on this vase has been attributed to Day. It had been in the collection of my late friend, Cindy Andrews, and is now in the Birmingham Museum of Art in Birmingham, Alabama. It is one of his designs which was adapted for use in the round. And it is often referred to as the orange pattern. Now that we have talked about how the arts and crafts movement was a factor in the Wedgwood Company creating new designs and the innovative process they employed to be able to produce this new product line more quickly and economically, I will take, you, I will take the rest of my time to show you examples of Wedgwood's Marsden ware. Here are several examples of Wedgwood's Marsden ware from my collection. This is a slip decorated charger with a wide floral border 
surrounding a central design of branches, leaves, and flowers. It has an impressed mark, is 16 and a quarter inches in diameter, and is from circa 1884. I have had this piece for many years after acquiring it from the Carol and Al Pierce collection, friends who had resided in California. This vase has a bulbous bottom and an elongated neck from the top of the neck descending to the shoulder, as well as the band above the foot, the body is decorated in a highly textured blue and brown ground. The bulbous section sports rust brown swirls outlined in gold. It is 10 inches high and it dates from circa 1885. This bottle shaped vase with gilt trim, flowers and scrolled vine decoration also has vertical banding to the neck and foot. Additionally, a diamond shaped decoration is on the neck. It is 12 and three quarter inches high with an impressed Wedgwood mark. This bottle shaped vase with gilt trim, striped neck and with alternating bands of gold and brown is also decorated with flowers on a teal ground. It is eight inches high, circa 1885. The photo on the right shows the bottom of the vase with the impressed Wedgwood mark. The short neck and upper portion of this attractive double gourd shaped vase has a dark glaze. The lower rather bulbous half has alternating sections in two shades of brown separated by buff colored lines. It is six and a half inches high and has a printed Wedgwood mark. This vase sports a buff ground on the rim and shoulder above a dark brown body, which is decorated with blue flowers. It is eight inches high and has scrolled vines. It is from circa 1885. The texture on the lower half of this vase is a good example of how Marsden's technique imitates true tube lining. The vase which we see now has alternating stripes in shades of brown in the upper section and blue flowers outlined in white with brown vines and brown leaves. The vase has a very tactile surface. When you run your hand over it, you can feel the outline of the design. It is eight inches high. It is from 1885. This is the same shape as the vase in the last slide with different decoration. This wonderful pair, pair of tall floor vases with light colored flowers, veined leaves and trailing vines stand in front of my fireplace in the library. The upper portion has a textured decoration on a black ground. The shoulder section of each vase is a reddish brown which flows into the remainder of the body which is dark brown. Each is 16 inches tall. It's dated from circa 1885 with an impressed Wedgwood mark. Here we have a pair of vases, each with blue flowers and green leaves in the center band. They have gold borders under the lips and are striped on the necks. The lower panel is a reddish brown with gold leaves. They are eight and a quarter inches high both have impressed Wedgwood marks and date from circa 1885. Here are two views of this vase, which once belonged to my friend Cindy Andrews. The coloring of this Wedgwood Marsden vase is interesting, being so different from the other examples. Here we have pink flowing down into blue and the lower panel has a textured hammer-like look in a silver colored application.
The following two tiles, likely designed by Louis Day, Foreman Day, were also formerly in Cindy's collection. The first one sports two flowers on a greenish blue background and is somewhat flat in texture and glaze. The second in a higher relief depicting the so-called orange design is on a pea green background. Wedgwood, Wedgwood's Marsden Ware pieces are highly collectible and are in many museum ceramic collections. This vase in the Victoria and Albert Museum, circa 1885, has a swirl pattern in brown, outlined in buff, all on a black background. From the Dallas Museum of Art, this rather striking vase, circa 1889, is banded in teal and black, over which are vines with leaves and flowers. It is nine and an eighth by 11 and seven eighth inches. On the left, sorry, I got a little lost here. On the left is an umbrella stand from circa 1887. It stands 21 and a half inches high and depicts foliage and scroll vines in brown, blue, and rust on a buff background. And on the right is a cheesekeeper dated 1883. It measures eight and three quarters by 11 and seven eight inches. The, the design motif on the cheesekeeper is like that of the design on the umbrella stand. This large cream colored charger with yellow and brown decoration has a central large sunflower. It is 10 and a half inches um, in diameter. This plaque, circa 1885, is composed of three tiles. The allegorical female stands in a landscape to a pale green ground and measures six inches by 18 inches. The plaque was formerly in the collection of an old friend, Sue Whiteson. A striking artware vase, circa 1890, it sports an orange and yellow background with flowers and leaves. It is nine and a half inches high, and the vase was formerly in the uh, Philadelphia collection uh, with friends whose name was the Zeitlins. This pair of artware vases, circa 1885, is decorated with flowers and foliage on a teal background. The neck and lower panel have a brown background punctuated with circles in bright turquoise. Additionally, there are bands of gold surrounding the neck, the rim, and the base. Just before I conclude, I wanted to add three Wedgwood pots, which belong to my friend Mickey Hightower of Dallas, Texas. Many Wedgwood collectors have been great friends for a long time. We share information, belong to the same societies, and we compete at the same auctions. And here are three pieces which I was the unlucky underbidder, but happily we're still good friends. The vase sports a teal ground with a central band of flowers. The pair of vases in the center have geometric bands at the top and bottom with daisies in the central band. And the charger has a dot and weave pattern around the center, which depicts flowing white flowers with green leaves. This heavily brown glazed advertising tile is in my collection. It measures seven inches by four and a quarter inches and was formerly in the Rhode Island collection of friends Beverly and Benton Rosen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity 
to share with you one of my collecting interests. Whenever I consider adding a Wedgwood piece to my collection, I always research it. In the case of Wedgwood's Marsenware, I wanted to learn more than just how it was made. It was important to understand why it was made. Josiah Wedgwood I knew that his product had to fit the prevailing taste of his time. His descendants, a century later, realized that for the company to remain viable, the ceramics it produced not only had to fit the aesthetic trends and quickly and in a cost-effective way, but at the same time had to compete with other English and continental ceramic manufacturers. Therefore, while the Wedgwood Company continued to produce stunningly beautiful pots in the neoclassical style for which they were famous, they also studied the current styles promoted by the giants of the arts and crafts movement. There were many new categories of production during the 19th century, which the consumer of Wedgwood ceramics could adorn their homes with and which collectors today covet. Wedgwood's Marsden Wear is but one. I hope that my relating the story about this specific area of Wedgwood's production has whet your appetite to research more about it, or better yet, to begin collecting yourself. I'll end. Thank you so much, Lorraine. <laughs>